scriptures, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, they would be transformed from signs on a page into channels of grace into our hearts. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Great. All right. So we're on Psalm 74. That's the song we're on now. 74. Okay. So, in Psalm 74, we meet Israel in a very dark place. So, for those of you kind of taking notes on the, uh, on the kind of the, the, the kind of psalm that it is, you know, before we, we typically do individual laments, or ILs, if you need to trade. Um, this is a CL, a community lament. So this is something that, you know, again, normally with the Psalms we've been going through, the, the vast majority of the Psalms are actually kind of in the, vo in, in the voice of an individual. I do this, I, you know, have, you know I am, you know, I am uh, desolate, I need your help, God. But this is really from the first person plural, it's a we, right? So this is, it's, it's, it's unique. And again, the, 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 the we, the we uh, community psalms of praise, CPs, are typically in the Sunday liturgy. <laughs> Those are the ones, the happy ones, where we all say on Sunday mornings. Um, and, but the community psalms of lament are uh, typically not, from, you know, pe God's people nowadays in modern America are not familiar with them because they're not read on a Sunday. And so you have, uh, you have it starting off I think that just that first question, it starts, you know, it's a psalm that starts with a question. Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? And that is, that is the question. So it's, I mean, it really is. That's the struggle of the psalm and of this part of Israel's life with God. So we, so this is, it says, a, a, a masculine of Asaph. Um, and so this is a part of the Psalter that, Again, we can see this as having been, we'll, we'll tell from within the psalm, the, um, the, that the context is going to be after the destruction of Jerusalem. Right? So this is a psalm of exile. It's a psalm of exile. And to a people who felt like there's no future. They cannot imagine a future for themselves. Everything that they... And so it's a psalm written from the point of view of someone who's lost everything. And so in a sense, that's the way in which we can enter into this. I call it, you know, we, this is a psalm of 3 a.m. This is a 3 a.m. psalm. And the way that you're feeling at 3 a.m., this is, this is where this psalm is coming from. And so to cast us off is a yet motif or a kind of a theme throughout the psalm. So that's, so you, it just starts out like a good poem, like let you know what the theme is right at the get-go. So this is going to be kind of an elaboration of the theme of being cast off by God seemingly forever. That's the problem. That, and, and so in a sense, like some of the Psalms wait a little bit to tell you what the problem, to tell God what the problem is. But this Psalm just starts right out of the, right out of the gate. The problem is we've been cast off forever. Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Now, I want to raise up the, um, the chutzpah might be a word for it, but just the, it says the courage, the spiritual courage to address God. It says basically we've lost everything. You know, it's like, we'll find out later in the psalm that they've lost everything, they, the Jerusalem's been destroyed, all their familiar cultural, political landmarks have been utterly wiped away, they're, in a, they're strangers in a foreign land, and still, who do they describe themselves as? Sheep of his pasture. We're still your sheep. We're still your sheep. They hold, you know, the people of God hold on to that identity with both hands. Like, no matter what happens, I am a sheep of your pasture. 
And that is, oh, that is so powerful. It's something that for us as God's people, we are called to remember that in those 3 a.m. moments when they happen in the broad daylight, that we are still God's sheep. We are still his beloved children. And so even in the midst of our desolation, we can still call out to him. That's the, that's the extraordinary power of this is that, you know, usually, if, you know, Again, in the, from the perspective of the world and the paganisms around them, God is close to you when you're large and in charge. Right? Being powerful makes you godlike. That's, I mean, so that's the pagan people. So that Marduk is with us because we 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 killed them all. You know, like, and, and he helped us do it. And and, the, and that's by the way, it's like everything is new again, right? So it's like that's the way of the world, right? It's like you are you are more divine when you are when your graph is going up and to the right, you know. You know we, so we've sublimated the violence into profits. So you know that, that's our that's our modern combat in the in 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 the uh, in the in the capital west. So. In the midst of that, the, the Israel has the, the the insight and also the brazen, you know, uh, courage to say, no, actually, even when we're not, even when we're completely desolated, God is still near to us. Somehow, we just have to figure out the how, and that's what the psalm is resting on. How could God possibly be near us? Because we know we're sheep of this pasture. We know the shepherd. We know we have a shepherd. We just don't know where the shepherd is right now. So shepherd, could you show up? Right. That's that's kind of the gist of the Psalms of Lament. And then you have this powerful word that begins in verse two. Remember. So you know, so there's someone we know that used that word in a very important context. Remember your congregation, which you acquired. Long ago. So what follows in verse two is in the in the again in the trade we call it anamnesis or remembrance. It's anamnesis is a remembering, a calling to mind of the historical past which defines the future. It's not just like remembering, oh, what did I eat for breakfast on Tuesday? That's not anamnesis. Anamnesis is Something that happened in the past that defines what will come forever and ever, right? It defines me again. So, so what we have here is anamnesis. So by the way, in the Eucharistic prayer, that's why I'm calling attention to this, this section of the Eucharistic prayer is called anamnesis. When basically the, after we do the, you know, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven, earth, and full of the people, and, 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 then you, and then the very next words that I say where basically it's a, it's a recitation of, of salvation history in shorthand. You know, you showed your love to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, Abraham, right? In, the, in the, your word through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus Christ, your son. That's anamnesis. In the prayer, it is called the anamnesis section of the prayer, right? It is the remembering, and that anamnesis builds up to the climax of do this in remembrance of me. Okay, so yeah, like that's like because that's the that is the climax. That's the buildup of the remembering is that we're remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That's the remembrance of that historical event which defines the future. It's not an event that stays in the past, like what you had for breakfast on Tuesday. Is a historical event that defines how you will be forever and ever. So what we have here is anamnesis. Remember your congregation which you acquired long ago, which you redeemed. So whenever you see the word, whenever you see the word redeemed or redemption, that's Exodus language. The what's the words underneath that in the in the Hebrew and the Aramaic are words that specifically mean kind of redeemed from captivity, slavery. So that is redemption. It was a, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a technical word. It's like what you do to something you pawn, right? If you take it to a pawn shop and you get money, and then you go and you get paid to get it back, you redeem. That's it's a transaction, and so they use the language of trans of economic transaction, like Paul in many ways, right? Paul uses so, so often the language of transaction, seal. Uh, that's a that's an economic term, like you know. So. Um, 
So to redeem means to kind of buy back, right? To, to get out of pawn. And so the people of God remember themselves as someone that God has gone back out of pawn in Egypt. So you redeemed us to be the tribe of your heritage. Notice that it says tribe, not tribes. So this is exile, right? When the difference between the 12 tribes. And by the way, you know, one of, one of the Sudanese bishops I knew, Bishop Bullen, you know, he said, you know, um, and this, I think, I, I can't remember if I told this story in a sermon. I'll have to check my notes or, maybe, or but we'll be coming. Um, I reserve the right to attempt to steal my own thunder. Um, and repeat myself, but Bishop Bola said, like, you know, when we when Christians meet each other in the in the bush, we're happy to meet another Christian. We don't care if he's a Catholic, a Presbyterian, or an Anglican. We're just being glad to meet another follower of Jesus because we know he won't kill us. So you know, it's like, whew, okay, my brother. Uh, you know, so you know, under suffering, those sorts of differences are relativized. Let's say, <laughs> you know, so. Now, in the suffering of the exile, all that stuff about, oh, well, are you a Danite or a Benjamite or a Judite or whatever, that doesn't matter anymore. We're all just Jews in Babylon. That's the only tribe that exists now. So it's the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you came to dwell. So it's that event of salvation history. So what this is, uh, in a sense, is what you have is kind of the Exodus traditions, a remembrance of the Exodus traditions. Um, the, I would say the acquisition tradition would be Abraham. So you acquired us long ago with Abraham, and then you redeemed us. That's the Exodus. And then Mount Zion is the royal tradition of God's holy presence on Mount Zion. Served by and, in a sense, stewarded by the Davidic king. Okay. So the Mount Zion where you came to dwell here comes the petition. So we're going to remember who God is and who we are in light of God, our election by God. And now we're going to, on the basis of that, we're going to, in a sense, if you think of it in a forensic setting or a legal setting, it's like we have standing in court. We have the right to come before God because after all, he picked us. <laughs> you know, it's, he's, we're his people. So now on the basis of that, they're going to come to a petition. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. It's like, uh, God, if you haven't noticed, your city was destroyed. <laughs> you, know, you know, just so you know, you might have noticed that there aren't any sacrifices going on. There aren't any prayers coming from Mount Zion. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. Notice that language of permanence about catastrophe. And isn't that how we are when we experience deprivation and catastrophe? We think this is forever. This can't, this is, this, I'm done. This can't ever get any better. So note that, that the psalm notes that, that human tendency to see our current desolation has our permanent status, as a permanent situation. But this is going to be relativized by grace. Right, here we go. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared within your holy place. Prayed upon us. We're the lamb. We're the sheep. The lions came. The Babylonian lions. If you've ever seen, uh, this kind of nerdy archaeological thing, but have you ever seen like the ruins of Babylon where they got those big lions at the gate? Those Babylonian lions came to your house and they roared. Where's your roaring back? You know, they want, it's like, you've got to answer this. This is an insult to you, God. This is an insult. It's like, it's, hey, you know, they're, they're picking on you, God, and maybe you ought to take this up. I'm just saying. They set up their emblems there. They planted their flag in your holy place. At the upper entrance, they hacked the wooden trellis with axes. And then with hatchets and hammers, basically the weapons of war. So when they were done killing the people of Jerusalem, then they turned to the temple. They smashed all its hard work. And so again, you have to, so cross-scriptural cross reference, you have, to, you have to have in your head that wonderful description, that loving, almost um, 19th century English novel-length description of the beauty of the temple that's in Chronicles. 
Like, Solomon's temple was so awesome. Let me tell you how many pomegranates there were. I mean, there were like these golden, like, and there were like angels, and like, yeah, the pillars going up, and they were like taller than anything. It's like, you know, you had these long descriptions of all the beautiful details of the temple. That's the tragedy of its destruction. Remember that those chronicles are preserved by people in exile, right? So we had a beautiful place, and they destroyed it. It's gone now. They set your sanctuary on fire. They desecrated the dwelling place of your name, bringing it to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. So in other words, it, 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 boy, it sure seems like their boast has come through. And so when we are in a place, and so that's what I'm talking about, the total desolation the total wiping out of all cultural, political, spiritual, emotional landmarks. Um, you know, it, it, think, I mean, just, I mean, for, for Pete's sake, I mean, in the, in the ice storm, you know, we felt discombobulated, and that was like three days long, and we got to move back in eventually, right? I mean, you know, this is, it has been destroyed, burned to the ground, it's nothing but ash forever, right? And as far as and you're in exile and you're never and you don't have the money to get back home, right? You're you're trapped there. We do not see our emblems. This is verse nine. We do not see our emblems. There is no longer any prophet, and there is no one among us who knows how long. So so not only do we are we not in your place that we are comfortable with, but we're not getting a word from you through. The, the prophets who, you know, they're not even, it's like they can't even come up with a good fit. I mean, you know, it's like they're silent. They're just like, you know, they can't even say, oh, we'll be better eventually. We're just hearing, but you're nothing. Radio silence. And if you have been in a place in your life where you have been praying in that place of desolation and you've gotten, you know, over the radio, this psalm is for you. When you have come to God and had nothing but radio silence, this psalm is speaking for you. There was no prophet left. There was no, the spirit didn't speak into our lives. There was not a word to say, okay, yes, you, you did badly, and I punished you, but as long as we do, we, we're not getting anything. Getting it's almost like the ethic of Israel, Semitic religion, it is, it's almost like, just, it, it'd be okay if you just told us, you know, like, you know, just, you know, just lay it on me. It's okay, but all, as long as you tell me that it's you, and as long as you tell me that you're still there, I'll take the beating. But the absence, that is too much to bear. That's too much to bear. That's the, the spirituality of the song. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? So in a sense, it's a daring of God. That's, and that's what I love about the Semites. They, they're, they're willing just to dare God. Like, listen, don't do it for us. Yeah. But shouldn't you be sticking up for your honor, God? <laughs> I mean, that's really what they're saying. It's like, they're, they're, they're saying, you believe in this Yahweh person. Where's Yahweh now? So Yahweh, shouldn't you? Show them. Why do you hold back your hand? Why do you keep your hand in your bosom? What a, it was an image. It's basically, you know, so I'm going to keep it here close to the vest, so to speak. I want your hand on my sword. Well, you know, yeah, but, yeah, I need your hand out here where I can do stuff, but keeping it in the bosom. So now, Look at the, you know, the, depending on your translation, you have, this is what I always like to highlight in the, in the Psalms, his poems, here's the turn. And the turn begin, in the NRSV starts with yet. Yet. And that word, and, and as I say in the, in the certainly like, for Paul, it's, it's Kai, but, you know, this, that, but, nevertheless, there's more to come, you know, it's like, hold on, it's like Paul saying, when Paul does it, it's kind of like, but hold on a second. This is the good news, right? It's like, you know, you were without hope in the world, and you know, you're just like, but right? now. And that's that's and, and Paul got that on came by that honestly, right? Because he started out of soul. 
he, he learned that habit of good of the proclamation through the scriptures of his own people. Yet, yeah. and so we turn from desolation into praise. Think about that. So now we're going to have another kind of anamnesis. So if you think about it, think there's yet another anamnesis, but this time it's an anamnesis that is completely in praise of God's greatness. Yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the earth. And by the way, the king, for God to be a king, that gets translated anointed one, Messiah. So that's, in, in, in Jewish expectation, the Messiah is the king, the anointed one, who is, again, in, in, the, in the thought of Second Temple Judaism, is somebody who is not God, the Father who is with it, but and yet is, is associated with him and is kind of is God, but not him. They were trying to feel their way towards it. Is, you know, God, Israel's hope was kind of groping towards a Messiah that would be God in showing up. Now, of course, they didn't have the doctrine of the Incarnation, but basically the Messiah was God showing up in person, in a human being. That much was laid in. Right? The, the, the Greeks helped us figure the rest out. So, <laughs> so um, yet God, my King, is from a working salvation in the earth. That is, our God not only created everything, creator of heaven and earth, but he's also eminent. That is, he's right here. He's, he's working salvation in the earth, not just in heaven. That's, you know, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You divided the sea by your might. There is the exodus. You broke the heads of the dragons and the waters. It can also be, besides either Exodus, Divine Sea 4, it can also be creation story time. So you think about, you know, the Genesis 1, the separation of the seas from the land, right? And so the dragons, Leviathan, are kind of the mythical monsters of chaos. And so God kind of crushes chaos um, with, through his might. And, you know, by the way, all those gods of the Babylonian... The, the, or the, the mythical god of the Babylonian story, you know, where you have like the sea monster, that's the creation monster, and it's like, yeah, God already, God already killed him. I mean, that's, I love this, just like the in-your-faceness of this, like, yeah, we might be a slave people, totally, just totally destroyed our homeland, but our god killed your gods, just saying. <laughs> I love that! I mean, it's just like, think, just think about that, just the, the brazenness. <laughs> That's who we're supposed to be like. That is who we are supposed to be like. We are supposed to have that same grace and courage to say, yes, we are. We have a gospel of suffering love. We see power made perfect in weakness because our God has already killed all your gods. God has already killed the God of the marketplace. He's killed the God of violence. He's killed the God of hatred. He's killed all the pagan gods that require human sacrifice for their glorification. He has killed them all already. It's a done deal. You're worshiping false gods now because they're dead. That is who we are called to be. This is the people of God revealed to us in the scriptures and the Psalms. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him his food for the creatures of the wilderness. Like he's like kind of God chopped him up and said, hey, hey, Bob, can't we do like that? Hey, like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, how can we make fun of their gods in a really funny way? It's like, yeah, you, you chop them up and turn them into prime rib for all the various animals in the, in the wilderness. You cut openings for springs and torrents. You dried up ever flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also the night. You establish the luminaries and the sun. Like sometimes it's the, the moon. So you, in some translations, you establish the moon and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You made summer and winter. That's actually one of the opening sentences of evening prayer, for those of you who do the office, right? And again, evening, the evening prayer is linked to that time. You know, we, when we do evening prayer, by the way, the mood is darkness is coming, right? You're supposed to say it at the vesper light when the daylight is going away, and darkness is coming, but we have the courage to face darkness because... God is with us. He's the God of day and night. Right? You know, he can still see. Right? You fixed all the bounds of the earth. You made summer and winter. And so now we're going to have a petition. Oh, I have, I'll give myself four more minutes. Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs 
An impious people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild animals. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. By the way, that's in the offices. Let not the poor be forgotten. That petition in the suffrage defense right here. So if in your prayer book you want to say, I always like to say, when you when you meet more Reformed friends, it's like, why do you pray the prayer book? It's like, well, the prayer book is just this arranging of the Psalms right here. So let, let the hope of the poor, you know, let the hope of the poor. So do not forget the life of your poor forever. But what a beautiful image. Do not deliver the soul of your dove. A, a defenseless animal. By the way, the animal that two of which Joseph and Mary brought to the temple to redeem their son Jesus with because they're poor. It's the gift of the poor. So the dove is that gift of the poor to God. And we are just the poor gift to God. And yet we are precious in the sight. We have a soul that God sees and cherishes and will preserve against the wild animals that want to eat us. Right? And so when you see, see it, you know, like the many, is in Psalm 22, the many, the mighty bulls of Bashan. You know, I'm surrounded by the mighty bulls of Bashan. When you feel, you know, packs of dogs close me in. That's a common image. And, and again, nowadays, if you have to, to experience this, you have to like really walk a ways in a national park. <laughs> to experience yourself being confronted by a wild animal that wants to eat you. Um, so, you know, we, it's, it's way far away from our collective experience and consciousness. But for a people who, where the wilderness is just, you don't have to go very far from Jerusalem or from your village to get into a place where you could be closed in by a pack of hyenas. And it's kind of like, okay, you've got to fight for your life. So that, that image of being surrounded. And so when you feel surrounded by your problems, surrounded by weakness surrounded by suffering closed in this psalm's for you this psalm's for you have regard for your covenant for the dark places of the land are full of haunts of violence that's a word to us isn't it boy, boy. do not let the downtrodden be put to shame let the poor and needy praise your name after all the mighty praise themselves in your name let the poor and needy just praise your name Rise up, O oh God, plead your cause. Remember how the impious scoff at you all day long. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of your adversary that goes up continually. So, in a sense, we remember you. Forget not us. Right? Don't let the voices of the sufferings of this world drown out the praises of your people. So, this is, a, this is that exploration of being cast off. And so even in the middle of that being cast offness, we remember that God is the Lord of all times and seasons. And he has us still in the grasp of his loving mercy, even at 3 a.m. in broad daylight. Amen. All right. All right. Well, great to see you. And we'll reset for the paraclete service.